This content is brought to you by Link2, which makes private equity investment easy. Link2 allows you to get access to companies before they go public, before they do an IPO. Within their portfolio includes fintech companies, artificial intelligence companies, as well as crypto companies. Some of the big crypto companies in their portfolio include Circle, Ripple, PolySign, Chainalysis, Dapper Labs, Ledger, and many more. So it's a great way to diversify your portfolio to get access to equity. So you may invest in crypto, stocks, ETFs, but now you can get access to equity in these companies before they go public. And obviously that can be very beneficial from an ROI standpoint. So if you'd like to learn more about Link2 and diversifying your portfolio, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Tomer Weller, who's the VP of Product at the Stellar Development Foundation. Tomer, great to have you on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Tomer, you guys are doing some exciting things on the Stellar side, smart contracts coming to the Stellar blockchain and much more. Uh, but I want to get to know you a bit better. Tell us about yourself, where you're from and where'd you grow up? Sure. So I spent most of my life in Israel, uh, born and raised in uh, Haifa, uh, did my uh, undergrad studies in Jerusalem in the Hebrew University. Um, and I also spent uh, a few good years in the Tel Aviv uh, startup taxi before eventually uh, moving to uh, to the U.S., initially to Boston. And what was your professional background before working at Stellar? Sure. So I'm... Uh, kind of like been all over the place. Uh, my my first uh, ever business was actually a food truck uh, in, in in German Psytrance festivals in 2006, uh, seven. So, um, but yeah, uh, kind of like more recently before joining Stellar, um, I was at the Media Lab in MIT and I was working on a, on a bunch of different research projects ranging from um, uh, decentralized systems, obviously, to uh, things like media ag aggregators. I also, the last project I worked at MIT on was uh, a 3D glass printer, an actual physical uh, 3D glass printer. Um, and I'm definitely, I think that if I wasn't in crypto, I would probably still be in the world of digital fabrication. Uh, I think it's like just super magical to to be able to design something on a computer and and then see it shape up in in real life it's it's pretty epic i mean you know you mentioned that uh, that is also a huge emerging market and you know in parallel with crypto and ai just the future of of how the world is going to work with I, i've been seeing like 3d printed houses and different products and so forth um that's just it's fa that fascinates me as well like the, the ability to do that and you know that becoming more prominent in different industries yeah i think the um there was definitely like a big boom a few years back everyone was talking about like 3d printers and this idea of like local fabrication um i think there was a bit of a step back from that i also i happened to as part of my studies i went to shenzhen and in, in china where uh, a lot of these things uh, a lot of the supply chains actually originate and I can tell you that it's like fabrication is hard and, uh, and, and you can see so many, you know, like anything that you have at home, like there are so many human hands, like touching and testing, like everything and kind of like replicating that uh, economy of scale, like across the world is just very difficult. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about the idea of local fabrication. I think we still have a ways to go there. Yeah, maybe AI will help uh, with a lot of that, right? And actually, yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. Human, the human touch to a certain degree, for sure. Um, so, what was your first encounter with Bitcoin or crypto, and what was your aha moment? So, these are definitely two very distinct moments. So, I think my first encounter was uh, in 2011. This is like very early on. I was still uh, in in Jerusalem, finishing up my undergrad. And my roommate uh, told me about this, uh, about this, you know, crazy Bitcoin thing. He actually started mining on his laptop and wow. he was making Bitcoin on his laptop, which is pretty nuts uh, thinking about it these days. Uh, but I kind of like, I, you know, I shrug. I said, this is just like nuts. Not, nothing's going to come out of this. Uh, clearly, you know, I was wrong and I should have <laughs> should have listened more carefully. Um, and, you know, throughout my time in MIT, we actually had uh, the Media Lab started this uh, digital currency initiative 
and it was sponsoring Bitcoin Core Development. But um, I, I never actually paid that much attention to it. I, was, um, I, I wasn't really sure where this industry is going. And uh, in 2017, when I was finally wrapping up my, uh, my work at the Media Lab, I was in San Francisco, I was talking with some companies on, um, on potential jobs, and I had offers from Google and Lyft, and nothing really felt right. Um, and I reached out to a friend of mine from MIT, Jeremy Rubin, who also happens to be a Bitcoin uh, core developer and very prominent in that, in that ecosystem. And he was doing some work for Stellar at the time, advising Jed on, on some protocol changes. And so, um, you know, I asked Jeremy, he said, you should talk to Jed. And you know what? I, I, I told him, uh, I actually don't do crypto. Like, I don't see a reason for me to talk to Jed. And Jeremy, who's, uh, by the way, like more than 10 years younger than me, uh, said uh, that saying you're not doing crypto in 2017 is like saying you're not doing web in the 90s and that I sound stupid when I say that. And so I should really meet with Jed. And so the following day, I met with Jed in the San Francisco office. Uh, I also met David Mazieres, who's the, uh, the Stanford professor who came with the consensus protocol, uh, some of the other crew. And there was just something very, um, uh, I think, uh, I was both sold on kind of like blockchain as as a as a tool for creating equitable access, uh, but also like Stellar at the time. And to be honest, even today, like it felt just like really uh, scrappy and focused, and there was like like great atmosphere. And even though it was you know they, the office back then was just like a shitty little apartment in, in the Mission uh, in San Francisco, but I just I just fell in love and. Uh, you know, packed my stuff up and moved from Boston to San Francisco the following week and uh, been with Stellar ever since. Wow. Um, so in a way, you are a crypto OG. You, you Back in 2011, you know, you know, you knew a Bitcoin, even though you didn't touch it or whatever it may be. And then in 2017, I mean, working with Stellar, uh, that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned Jed, and, and there was certainly some questions in the community asking, hey, is Jed still active at Stellar? We know he's had his hands in a lot of different crypto projects. You know, uh, Can you tell us what's the latest and greatest with Jed as much as you can? Sure. Everyone always wants to know what's going on with Jed. Um, Jed is definitely still involved uh, more on the strategic level. Uh, I actually met him earlier uh, this week. Uh, uh, I'm, in, I'm in SoCal and his... Uh, his hanger for Vast is also uh, around the block. So I don't know if you guys know, but he's uh, he's actually building a space station these days amongst amongst other things. And I, I actually spent some time in the hangar and um, I was in the, um, uh, they actually have like a, a physical space that simulates that and being in that is, is pretty wild. So uh, he's doing a lot, definitely involved with Stellar, also involved with other, um, uh, uh, things in AI. So he's kind of like all over the place. A uh, great person to have on board, really great strategic thinker. Uh, and I'm really glad to have him still involved. Uh, that's awesome. Um, and I'm very curious, you know, if VAS is going to be using the Stellar blockchain, I'm assuming it will in certain ways, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, so there was big news of smart contract functionality being brought to the Stellar blockchain. Tell us about that. You know, um, what was the premise, and what are, are the utility and functionality um, opportunities that are opened up for, uh, with this uh, integration? Sure. So, um, you know, Stellar's mission has remained consistent throughout the years, which is providing equitable access to the world's financial system. And um, you know, smart contracts are kind of like the next evolutionary step in enabling that. So we already have this amazing global infrastructure. So we have a, a global network of uh, uh, interoperable on and off ramps. We call these anchors, uh, which are providing access to uh, crypto through local payment rails. Um, and uh, smart contracts kind of like give developers direct access to that. So uh, as, a, as an ecosystem developer and seller, you'll be able to build you know, an AMM that has like direct access to, to, to cash, for example, through MoneyGram. Or you can build a lending protocol that has direct access to the Brazilian financial system through you know, N tokens and the PIC system in, uh, in Brazil. Um, so you know, we've we've learned a lot from other blockchains uh, and and there's um, a great opportunity in being a late 
a, a, a late mover in this in this world of smart contracts. Um, and I'm really proud of what we've built in the past year and a half. Uh, we've talked with industry leaders across the board from different blockchains and different smart contract platforms um, and built something that is really uh, robust, uh, builds on established standards, um, and really learns from, from, from what's out there today. And I think, you know, we got a bit of a painful reminder last week with uh, the Curve uh, incident and, and around the Viper stack. On, on some of the issues with these, you know, what I call like the Gen 1 smart contract protocols. And I think that, you know, in 2023, like we can do better. Like we don't have to launch a smart contract platform that has the same issues that, um, you know, the EVM has, which was launched in 2015 before we necessarily understood uh, a lot of the risks involved. Hmm. And to confirm the name of this functionality, if I'm, and I hope I have this right, Soraban? Yeah, the smart contract platform is called Soroban. Um, it's uh, built on WebAssembly, uh, which is a, a super well-established standard. Um, uh, came out of you know Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, and other giants after kind of like years of of careful design. So uh, we're really happy with the WebAssembly standard. Uh, our main SDK is in Rust, which is a super established. Uh, uh, programming language, uh, you know, from some of the brightest minds in the world of programming languages. Um, uh, it, it has a wonderful ecosystem of tooling, including, um, you know, things like fuzzing and formal verification tooling that we're adopting for the Soroban ecosystem. Um, so yeah, uh, Soroban is coming and we couldn't be more excited. Um, so I wonder if you can break this down for me and I hope uh, I'm articulating this well. So um, with this smart contract functionality, is it a layer two on the Stellar blockchain or is it integrated into the Stellar blockchain itself as a layer one functionality? And what uh, protocol is it using? You know, there's proof of stake and, and, and others out there. So if you can break that down for us. Sure. Um, so this is not an L2. We're basically integrating this directly into the L1. And, um, you know, we talked a lot with the ecosystem about different ways of imp implementing smart contracts. And we landed on, you know, everyone uh, really wanted to see the, these smart contracts inherit the, um, the security properties of the, the Stellar Network directly without adding additional layers of trust above it. Uh, so it's completely integrated within the uh, within the uh, the current protocol, and you can think of it as as execution lanes. So basically, um, you know, you would be able to sign a transaction that makes a regular payment uh, that uses what we call like the classic Stellar network, and that's great, uh, super cost efficient, uh, super simple, and you could do that, or you could invoke a Soroban smart contract, and so we have like these multiple execution lanes. But all of them run on the same infrastructure, the same validators, the same consensus protocol. Uh, the, the consensus protocol that Stellar uses is called the Stellar Consensus Protocol. It's a form of federated Byzantine agreement. And, and the general gist there is that you actually say, as a validator, you explicitly point your trust at other validators. So for example, if I work with specific financial institutions or specific banks, I can actually uh, explicitly say that these are uh, the, the validators that I trust. This is my, my, um, my quorum slice. And then the network, uh, like the, the basic algorithms, like this recursive voting algorithm that figures out what's the quorum intersection of all of these uh, validators and then uses that as a source of truth. Um, so one way that I like to think about it is if, uh, if in you know proof of work you put your trust into compute power or like machines, and proof of stake you put your trust into kind of like wealth into whoever holds like the most cryptocurrency. In Stellar, trust is very explicit. So you trust the actual entities that you trust. So there's no, uh, there's, uh, you don't have this indirectness of like using these, um, you know, like a stake or compute power. Mm, got it, got it. That makes sense. Um, so this seems, if I'm not mistaken, almost like the first of its kind, right? But compared to what's already out there in the market. Um, and I, I may be off, uh, based on that, but you know, given the protocol that you guys have and integrated into the layer one, um, is is that correct or or, or fair to, fair to say? 
Um, when you say first to market, you're talking about specifically about the consensus protocol or about the smart contracts uh, platform? Well, I guess the, the, uh, the, I guess because if I'm not mistaken, does, does, doesn't the XRP ledger l- leverage a similar protocol, but they don't have smart contract technology on there? Right. So there are very uh, there are various protocols out there that um, use their own consensus protocol uh, that is not necessarily proof of stake or proof of work. Uh, Ripple does have a the XRP ledger does have a mechanism which I'm not intimately familiar with in which trust is is also uh, explicit, but the algorithm is a bit different uh, from how it's used um, and. To the best of my knowledge, the Ripple algorithm is a bit more centralized and relies on kind of like a centralized entity to provide you uh, the, the kind of like the, the list of validators that you need to trust. Um, so Stellar is very different. We do have other uh, other networks that launched after Stellar that use uh, similar um, similar protocols. Uh, Mobile Coin, for example, which came from uh, uh, Signal, actually used the Stellar consensus protocol as well. Um, and and there are others, but uh, it's definitely a minority in the world of, uh, of blockchains. We do see a very uh, a strong bias towards proof of stake. Unfortunately, to be honest, right. So th- this could be uh, it could be argued that this is like maybe a generation three, uh, you know, blockchain with the capabilities that you guys are adding for smart contracts. Um, uh, you know, a bit more advanced for for some folks who are not. Uh, you know, essentially proof of stake fans who say that's a bit unfair, right? Because it's the wealthy that control um, that protocol. So I, I think um, it makes sense to branch out from that. Yeah. Um, so, I, and you probably address this, but I'm curious, let's say like a partnership with MoneyGram, right? With this smart contract uh, functionality, what would they be able to do? Like, what are some real world use cases that MoneyGram, for example, just as an example, or any other partner can can take this and, and put together? Sure. So like I said, on and off ramps are huge, uh, a, a huge focus area for, for Stellar and the Stellar Development Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this is something that people are, are now starting to recognize like, how important it is. Uh, and we've been really focused at it since... Uh, you know, since the beginning of, of, of the network, before even stable coins were, were a term that was being used. Um, and so um, we have a global network of these interoperable on and off ramps. We call them, we call them anchors. Um, and we have, uh, we have anchors that uh, deal with like local payment rails, like PIX in Brazil or with SEPA in, um, in, in Europe or ACH in the States. MoneyGram is uh, is another anchor in the network. They're very unique in that their main payment r- payment rail is cash access through four hundred thousand more than four hundred thousand locations around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Stellar integration means that you can walk in with a Stellar integrated wallet, uh, like Vibrant, for example, into a MoneyGram agent and actually turn your USDC in your crypto wallet into cash. Now. Uh, it's you know it's one thing to talk about this in my Santa Monica kitchen, but but it's really magical when you're like on site doing this. So uh, we were in Argentina a few months ago, um, and getting cash in Argentina is extremely difficult. Like you you either go to a, a bank in which uh, you know you can get cash, but you're going to get a very unfavorable uh, rate for your dollar uh, to peso conversion, mm-hmm. or you can take actual dollar bills. Uh, to these like combio places in, in downtown Buenos Aires. And it it feels a bit, you know, dangerous and 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 dodgy just like walking around with with all this cash. And with MoneyGram, the experience was completely different. So, you know, I, I literally took my vibrant wallet, walked into a MoneyGram agent, gone through the process, got ca- cash in my hand, uh, threw USDC in my in my crypto wallet. And uh, all of this in like a favorable rate because MoneyGram has like this favorable rate in um, in Argentina. So it's like completely magical. Uh, we're seeing more and more wallets getting integrated with this. So we already have Vibrant, Lobster, Beans, uh, Decaf, um, Wipe It. More and more are coming. And the cool thing about this whole integration is that it builds on an interoperability standard that we already have. We call it SEP24 Interactive Deposits and Withdrawals, 
And it allows any anchor that onboards to just like implement their standards, this specific standard, and then any wallet, any Stellar wallet that has this um, uh, on and off RAM standard already integrated, they can just easily turn it on. So um, this, been, this has been paying in dividends, uh, this, this really uh, simple integration. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, you know, the example you give here in the United States, we don't think about it, but in other parts of the world, it, it's a challenge. And uh, like you said, to get a fair, uh, you know, value for your dollars or whatever it may be. Um, so with the MoneyGram uh, partnership, anything new or anything you can share that's on the roadmap there? Um, uh, I know you guys have been working. I've been seeing the updates with USDC on and off ramps being built in different parts of the world. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the most interesting things that have happened the year, this year is the launch of Stellar Aid Assist, uh, which takes advantage of the Stellar network, the Anchor network, and specifically MoneyGram to deliver aid in Ukraine. So UNHCR and other organizations are actually using this to disperse aid because that's like just, um, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. Like, how do you actually get money to people? Um, and traditionally, there's been a lot of cash involved in the process. You actually have like agents on the ground that are distributing cash. With Stellar Aid Assist, uh, we built this uh, system. It's called SDP, the Stellar Disbursement Platform, in which partners can basically upload a bulk list of um, you know, KYC information. These are the people that uh, uh, should be getting aid. They get like an SMS sent to them and they get, uh, uh, they get help in setting up this uh, vibrant wallet account and a Stellar account, and then they get the disbursement into their crypto wallet, and they can either keep it there um, in case they don't need to use it immediately, or they want to move, uh, you know, they might want to move cross borders, and it's just like weird carrying around all this cash, or they can go to a local MoneyGram agent and convert that into cash using the MoneyGram integration. So mm -hmm. this actually solves like a real world um, problem. Uh, we're super proud of this. Uh, it's getting more and more traction. Uh, so uh, we're seeing more and more aid getting dispersed. But more than that, we are uh, just about to open source the, the actual underlying uh, platform, SDP, the Stellar Disbursement Platform. Mm -hmm. And this will allow for other entities to use this for, uh, for batch payments. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be aid. It can also be things like um, uh, like paying salaries uh, for uh, freelancers around the world and a bunch of other use cases. And so this really is an example of how this, um, you know, all this infrastructure that we've built throughout the years uh, is, is something that we can actually utilize in an application. So how it's, you know, how it's paid off. Uh, that's great. Um, and I love the real world application. You know, it, it is often... Uh, a lot of critics of crypto and blockchain and and many who fail to see or don't want to see like some of the use cases out there. And I think more of these things have to be highlighted uh, of the benefits of crypto and blockchain. So that's really great. Um, there was also news about Bitso and, and you, you hinted towards this, uh, the uh, Latin American crypto company. Uh, they integrated the Stellar Anchor network uh, to allow companies around the world to make payments to Argentina. Um, is, is there anything else you want to highlight there? I know you touched a bit on it. Sure. So, um, you know, like I said, Stellar was built originally around the idea of cross-border payments. So, the, so if you look at the classic Stellar protocol, it's really focused on that. Everything, all the, the basic operations are geared toward uh, currency conversion, asset issuance, and uh, and making these like path payments, which is like these cross-currency payments. Um, and so Bitso specifically is the largest exchange in Latin America, super active in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico. And they integrated into another interoperability standard. So previously I was talking about uh, uh, an interactive interoperability standard. Uh, um, Bitso integrated with something called uh, bilateral cross-border payment standard, which basically allows you to integrate with other remittance agencies around the world and other wallets. Uh, so uh, we're seeing more and more wallets integrating into this and through the Bitso integration, they can actually disperse uh, payments to people, uh, to and from people in Latin America 
through all the payment channels that are currently accessible to Bitso. And because Bitso are so big in Latin America, they pretty much have every payment rail uh, in Latin America covered. Uh, so for example, uh, we're now seeing uh, different wallets, for example, Mycobo in, in, in Europe um, are, are utilizing specifically Bitso for uh, cash outs uh, of remittances in Mexico. So you'll able to send um, you know, cash or you're able to send money starting from your digital wallet in Europe all the way to, um, to a bank account in Mexico. Wow. Um, and then there was also news around Allbridge introducing a cross uh, chain bridge, uh, which unlocked interoperability between Stellar, Ethereum, Solano and, and other blockchains. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So, you know, we were talking about cross-border payments and, and the, this idea that Stellar from the get-go was all about interoperability. And originally it was interoperability between, you know, traditional financial systems because that's what we had in 2014, 2015 when, when, when Stellar was launched. But we live in a very different world uh, these days and we have these like thriving crypto economies. And we want to make sure that Stellar does a really good job in bridging every type of financial system. So these like trust minimized uh, bridges that allow you to move between chains are super important to facilitate these use cases. So Allbridge is uh, one bridge that's uh, being launched. Axelar is another one that is actually building on Sorobon on the smart contracts. And what they do is they allow Stellar, user, Stellar users to leverage assets across chains. So let's say for example, that I have, um, you know, I'm like liquidating a position in Compound and Ethereum, and now I have like USDC in my uh, uh, or some other uh, Ethereum specific coin in my wallet, and I actually want to cash out. What am I? What are my options right now? I'm kind of limited to the uh, to whatever you know the Ethereum ecosystem has, and we now know. And by the way, there was this um, report coming out of the uh, block last uh, last month. Uh, researching on and off ramps and, and demonstrating how Stellar uh, through the MoneyGram integration is the, the most accessible um, uh, kind of like fiat to, um, uh, to crypto network. So if I want to utilize that, but I'm on a different chain, then Allbridge or a, another bridge allows me to move from like my USDC or ETH on Ethereum to an asset on Stellar and from there to cash. So from that perspective, you can think about Stellar uh, being used universally as like an on-off ramp network, even if what you're doing is not specifically happening on Stellar. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and, and that makes sense. Uh, and I've often talked about it on the podcast, interoperability between different chains, and it's going to be a multi-chain world and, and the ability to move between each of them. So that's really great. Yeah. And we're not, you know, we're not chain maximalists where uh, we think there's enough to go around and, and there are different use cases and great use cases for other chains out there. And so we want to make sure that, you know, we're working, uh, you know, together with them and, and not against them. For sure. Um, folks wanted me to ask you about uh, Stellar and IBM and any updates around that partnership. Yeah. Um, no updates on that partnership. So this is uh, it's definitely an OG question. I think the, the IBM partnership is something that uh, we launched in the end of 2017, early 2018. And uh, IBM at the time uh, had a division called Worldwire, uh, which was basically building uh, infrastructure. As you know, IBM serve a lot of uh, financial institutions and banks, and they wanted to add like another layer for cross-border payments. Uh, and so they built Worldwire. Um, I'm, it didn't really mature to, uh, to, to production. Uh, I think that they, they learned that building these types of services is, is probably, um, not easy. Um, they did eventually, uh, that team open source their work. Uh, and so you can actually look at this in, in GitHub, IBM Worldwire. Um, and so that I'm afraid didn't really mature. Uh, but I do think, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was there when 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 the IBM partnership happened, and, and I think it was a really great spotlight on the cryptocurrency world. And a lot of people, even though this specific project didn't mature to production, it brought a lot of financial institutions into the world of blockchain. So from that perspective, I think um, it 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 did have like indirect success. 
Got it. Um, and let's say the model that you guys have with MoneyGram, um, is it like an exclusive partnership with MoneyGram or would you go to like Western Union and some of these other payment companies and say, hey, <laughs> look what MoneyGram's doing here. We can also facilitate to help improve. Uh, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're not, the foundation doesn't do exclusive deals. So uh, we're, we're very happy. We've, we've talked to Western Union on, on various occasions. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're very open for anyone to come in and play. And by the way, all of this is completely open. So uh, you don't, uh, you know, none of this is, uh, requires our permission or, or our help. We, we're always happy to extend our help, especially with, uh, with uh, companies that have uh, the, the reach to kind of like help further the mission of the Stellar Network. But at the end of the day, all of these standards are completely open source, open spec, the network is completely open source, open spec. Anyone can come and play. Uh, nothing is is nothing requires permission. Mm. Uh, that's great. Um, what's on your the roadmap for the remainder of 2023? Um, anything that you can highlight? You know, it's, I know sometimes things are under wraps, but whatever you can highlight. Yeah. So obviously, the the biggest thing is 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 still Sorobon. So we've been developing this for the past year and a half. Uh, we've had 10 preview releases, um, and we're about to go on the public test network soon. Um, and we want to go on by, uh, some sometime during Q4. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're right now at the point where the, the software itself is feature complete. Um, and so, you know, anyone who wants to come and develop is welcome to do that. We actually have a great... Uh, community fund program that funds projects that want to, wants to build on Soroban, even though it's not launched yet uh, on mainnet. Uh, I think we've funded more than 70 projects uh, since the beginning of the year, which is pretty mind blowing given that we actually haven't launched on, on, uh, on mainnet yet. Wow. Uh, so the next few months are really about hardening the system, making sure that it's robust and making sure that um, um, you know, it can run in parallel to the Stellar, to the existing Stellar infrastructure without taking a toll on the system. Uh, so basically lots of kind of like software engineering here. Um, and uh, yeah, so Soroban is, is a really big thing. Uh, like I said, the disbursement platform is also something that we're about to, uh, to open source. And I'm really excited to see the kind of, you know, new products and new services that people build with this ability to connect between batch payments on Stellar to local payment rails uh, and, and, you know, things like MoneyGram, uh, that integration. Yeah. I mean, that's exciting. Uh, well, we'll have to have you back on in Q4 when <laughs> everything goes sure. live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's exciting. Um, let's talk a bit about the crypto market at large. Um, you know, Bitcoin's been rallying since January seems the dark cloud of FTX and all the things that happened last year have uh, been driven away with BlackRock and all these folks entering the market. Uh, what are your thoughts on you know the upcoming halving and do you see new all-time highs in, in 2025? Um, it, obviously I can't predict asset prices. Right. Um, you know I, I think that judging by the past and we've both been in this industry for for, for a few of these runs. so uh, I think the things that I've observed, um, are that, um, you know, it can be great in terms of bringing attention to this ecosystem. Uh, and it's especially exciting when builders suddenly like pay attention uh, because of because of all the press that we're getting. And then, you know, they look for things to build, you know, they might end up, you know, building on Soroban, which is great. I'd love to see more people building on Soroban indirectly because, uh, because of some, uh, you know, magical events happening in the Bitcoin ecosystem. With that said, you know, there's also a lot of distractions uh, that come with these, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if people, you know, obsess over speculative markets, it means that sometimes there's like less attention to building and more attention to investing and making, you know, mooning and Lambos and all that shit, right? <laughs> yes. So, you know, so we want to make sure, you know, it, it, it can be positive, uh, and I want to make sure that we focus on like the former and, and bring like more builders into the ecosystem rather than building um, just, um, um, yeah, hype. 
for sure. Yeah, and I think you know the speculation layer always exists in the markets, but for crypto specifically, it seems the speculation noise and and has gained most of the attention, right? But uh, the building has to be there, and and this technology has to go into the real world and be adopted in different ways, kind of like what you guys are doing with MoneyGram. Um, what are your thoughts though on like these big players that I think? It seems like we've hit a new tipping point of institutional adoption, like BlackRock um, and and Fidelity and Charles Schwab, Citadel, all these folks getting involved, launching crypto exchanges. Uh, BlackRock, while they filed for a Bitcoin spot ETF, they're also, I think, custodying, if I'm not mistaken, some of the USDC reserves and much more. You know, what are your thoughts on that? I think you know, bottom line, this is all good. Uh, I think bringing uh, this kind of like t this type of attention and and these these type of um, you know like traditional finance brings like mass adoption and that's great um, and and bringing liquidity to these markets is super important because liquidity is like this building block for anything to happen in in the crypto world right um, so you know it's good for attention I think it's important that um, we. Uh, we maintain blockchains as like you know public, um, you know public uh, public goods that are that are open and accessible, and so uh, we we need to make sure that uh, like these type of instruments don't become like the only way that people access crypto because that's you know it's kind of like too abstracted away and it's great for uh, for um, uh, you know speculative investments it's not great for utility. Uh, so we need to make sure we, we, we focus on the, the public nature and the utility of, of these networks. Um, and, and, you know, like, and we need to make sure that we remember that these things are building blocks. Like it's not the end goal, like be like having the ability to trade Bitcoin. It's not the end goal. If it yeah. is, we should just pack up and go home. Like, like the end goal is, is building utility, building financial access. And these things are just building blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. Um, on that note, you know, as builders, innovators, entrepreneurs, and folks like yourself are trying to, you know, get this technology uh, out to the masses, and, and not just from an investment standpoint, but building, solving problems, improving payments, all all that jazz. Um, there's still a lack of clarity here in the United States. Um, you know, Congress is trying. It seems like recently putting out a uh, a bunch of bills. They still have to get approved through the House, then go to the Senate and become law. Um, and then on the other layer, you have the SEC, you know, going after a lot of exchanges, projects, and so forth. But there was a big ruling in the Ripple case where uh, XRP, the asset, was declared not a security intrinsically. Secondary market sales, not a security, uh, which is impactful to the entire uh, crypto market. What are your thoughts on the entire situation, the Ripple ruling, as well as Congress and, and the crypto bills? Yeah, look, the Ripple ruling. Uh, not gonna pretend. Super happy about it. Uh, I think I think the entire industry kind of like uh, was excited to to finally see um, some, you know, like you know, just like like you read that ruling. It's it's good and it's encouraging uh, for the entire industry, not just for uh, not just for Ripple. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're super optimistic about the potential impact on uh, you know kind of like the legislative dialogue. Uh, we have a very strong policy team that's um, uh, in DC working on these things, and it's it's just nice to see this progress after after a long period of time in which you know all you heard about was kind of like you know SEC and enforcement actions, and so you know this progress is is encouraging and and actually seeing like bills come out of these committees and 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 starting making their way to the House, uh, that's great. Uh, and and just seeing that Congress is is balancing out some of the kind of like overzealous uh, enforcing agencies, that is that's super great. Uh, I'm you know I'm no DC expert by the way. I'm not even a, a citizen of, of of the state, so um, uh, so not not an expert in any way. Uh, but I understand that uh, there's still quite the journey and a long windy road from from what we're seeing right now to actual getting like legislation out there. Yeah, I'm hoping they were able to uh, get something through this year before the election cycle next year, but we'll have to wait and see. But uh, it seems the narrative, there's a shift, there's more of a focus on realizing this industry needs proper regulations, balanced regulations, 
protect consumers, but also allow the innovators to do their thing, the builders to do their thing, have that clarity. Um, now, um, you touched a bit on you know DeFi 1.0, and we've seen, I mean, so many exploits and flaws. Um, a hard question for you, man. Uh, when do you think we're going to get to a point where it's not every month we're going to hear about some exploit with some DeFi protocol? Uh, you know, uh, is it the, the third iteration? I don't know. And uh, is that five years away? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think we're getting closer. Uh, it's definitely still a bit of a wild west. Uh, and I think uh, I was actually just in in Paris in the. Uh, so ECC was in Paris, and I also participated in the DeFi Security Summit and kind of uh, got to hear a lot about the work that's being done in security. Um, and I think that like the ecosystem is really maturing in the level of uh, tooling that we're building, um, the level of audits, uh, just the sheer amount of security experts that are in the field. are uh, It's making me feel like more and more optimistic. Um, with that said... You know, we're still innovating. Uh, this world is still um, moving at a fast pace. I think that in order to actually make these things accessible to to, to wider markets, uh, we probably need to bring in some more um, insurance agencies on on board and to make sure that people's deposits don't solely rely on um, on kind of like the security of these protocols. Um, and so, I think that for the foreseeable future, at least for the next couple of years. It's still going to be, you know, the more crypto native, uh, you know, high risk tolerance people that are in this space. Um, and, you know, from a tech perspective, I just really want to see this industry uh, move forward. I think that, uh, you know, we've learned so much from uh, from from the things that have happened in the past, you know, uh, eight years of, of the existence of DeFi. And so, like, we just need to be doing better. Like, I think that the fact that we still have new protocols and new networks launching with, you know, with things that we already know don't work, uh, all in kind of like uh, in, in the name of like, you know, EVM compatibility, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's misguided and it's uh, kind of like very narrow vision. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I'd like to see people making more progress and, and, and kind of like moving on. For sure. Yeah. You know, personally, I've stayed away from anything, uh, DeFi lending and borrowing anything along, along those lines. Cause I'm just worried, man. Uh, you know, things are not just going to, not going to go well, but you know, I think eventually we'll, we'll get there. Uh, it's just going to be kind of a painful process. It seems like. Yeah. And I do think like you look at some of like the more mature protocols, I have, uh, I have a lot of faith in Uniswap and compound and maker, I think we've seen them go through a lot throughout the the years, and uh, and and you know they're still they're still there, and they've uh, definitely survived some uh, some black swan events. So I definitely, um, you know, I I deposit into Uniswap, and I have uh, and and I'm very uh, you know I don't feel like it's uh, too at risk, um, and a lot of these protocols. I think that if you you know if you don't do your research and if you invest in a in a USD stablecoin that guarantees twenty percent APY, then you know I wouldn't say you deserve it, but but there's definitely a problem there. Like like you know dollars don't make twenty percent like safe dollars don't make twenty percent APY. So if something is not something's off, if that's happening, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, what what are your thoughts on NFTs and the metaverse? Um, certainly NFTs. Look, artwork aside, I think the uh, the, the, the tokenization um, has real world application. Um, in addition to collectibles and art, I'm not you know poo pooing in that, but rather I, I want to see NFTs in the movie industry, the music industry, and much more. Um, and then integrated you know with the metaverse as well. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. So you know on the on the NFT front, I agree. I think that there's a lot of real world use cases for NFTs, and I'd like to see more of them. And uh, and uh, also Sorobon on Stellar enables that. So uh, it would be great to see some more of this, uh, especially around. Uh, I do think that kind of like, you know, there are real, real world assets uh, that are, you know, NFTs like real estate, stuff like that. Uh, right. I'd love to see that go on chain. Um, and um yeah, I think like, you know, various like types of subscriptions, 
um, and, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, proof of attendance and stuff like that. I'm, I'm definitely excited about that. I'm, I'm a bit more uh, s- skeptical of like the metaverse in general. I, f- I find it to be a bit, uh, a lot of the concepts to be a bit dystopian. Uh, but, but I do, I do feel like, um, you know, you have these, uh, it's kind of like you have these dating apps that are, uh, that they're the sign of if, if the, if the app has like, uh, succeeded is if you delete it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that like the metaverse to some extent, uh, you know, I'd love, I'm a reality maximalist. I'd like to see people, people, uh, connecting with, with other people in real life. And if the metaverse is 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 something that enables that and the metaverse and success with the metaverse is kind of like spitting you out of the metaverse then i'm i'm totally into that yeah and i I know we're still early so we'll have to see how it goes so i guess it's safe safe to assume you know you mentioned dystopian you're not a fan of world coin you're not going to get your eyes uh scanned right um (laughs) you know what i'm i'm not as aggressively against as some people in the industry are, I think that um, I think that people don't understand to what extent they already don't have privacy, and sometimes they just, they just like push in the, uh, on privacy in like the wrong places. And so the question is like, can I use um, you know like my existing lack of privacy to my own benefit? Right. So I think I actually think that world kind of is kind of like in the gray area. Um, I'm and and yeah, kind of like TBD. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see what, what they come up with. It seems like a lot of folks are pushing back and uh, the orb is a bit dystopian, but I understand the solutions, the things that they're trying to solve, the problems they're trying to solve. Um, yeah. Um, all right. I got some wrap up questions here for you. And um, sure. I, I guess the first one you're probably going to say nothing about and that is if you can create your own metaverse what would the theme be (laughs) oh yeah definitely a metaverse that's uh like a yeah like a self-destructive metaverse (laughs) one that like ejects the people from the metaverse (laughs) and i got some rapid fire questions here for you Uh, favorite food um sabich it's uh it's an israeli street food it's a pita bread that you get filled with uh potato hard-boiled eggs uh and fried eggplants salads tahini it's it sounds weird but it's delicious if you're ever in israel uh, that sounds great yeah it, you know funny thing is and i have a friend his name is ziv and uh we used to work together for a long time we talked about taking a trip to israel and he told me about the foods it's just great and uh I, i'm gonna have to try that when we finally get yeah, to go <laughs> for sure yeah uh favorite musician or band uh, that fluctuates a lot. I'm actually listening to a lot of uh, Smashing Pumpkins right now because I'm going to their show next week. Uh, oh, yeah. So that's kind of like a childhood idol. So really looking forward to that. Um, yeah. Lots yeah, of Devin Townsend these days. Yeah. I, lo- I love the Smashing Pumpkins. So that- that's awesome. Um, yeah. Favorite movie? Uh, Snowpiercer. Oh, it's the- <laughs> yeah. You know, when I first saw that that movie pop up, I was like, "Oh, what is this nonsense?" And I watched it. I was like, "Wow, this is really good." It's actually- yeah, I, I feel like it's definitely underrated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't feel like yeah, there are some scenes there that are just like epic. Yeah, it's 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 really, it's really good. Uh, favorite book? Um, this is uh, a bit cliche for an engineer, but uh, definitely uh psych p the structure and interpretation of computer programs it's like this mit intro to cs book from uh, i think from the 80s uh really great if you're into lisp it's like the book oh, awesome and when you're not doing you know any engineering computing whatever it is uh what are you doing for fun as a hobby um so i actually haven't been practicing since covid but glass blowing uh is something that i was uh i started at mit and i and i really love um and other than that uh yeah lots of uh biking mountain biking homer um i'm really excited for sorbonne uh coming up in q4 we'll have to have you back on pleasure chatting with you thank you so much awesome looking forward to it thank you so much